In the headlines, President Pakune calls for a better policy coordination between her cabinet and office amid public backlash over the government's failed policy coordination. Concerns over the quality of jobs for the elderly rise as the Korean population is aging rapidly and people are set to work longer even after retiring. And U.S. President Barack Obama comes out with his new budget plan for the next fiscal year. The key is taxing the rich to revive the middle class. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I am Kang Tae-ri. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with President Bakane's drive to create a smooth running engine when it comes to creating coordinated government policy. Amid recent hits to her approval ratings, the move for the cabinet and her staff at the top office to better consult each other on policies may create more thorough and well-received measures for the public. Our Choi Yoo-san has our top story. Amid a public backlash over the government's tax policy revisions and its suspension of reforms to the National Health Insurance Program, President Park Geun-hye called for greater coordination between the cabinet and her office. 새로 신설이 되는 정책 조정 협의회를 통해서 청와대와 내각 간의 사전 협의와 조율도 강화해 나가기를 바랍니다. She emphasized that officials must clearly understand how a policy will affect the lives of the public through simulations and data analyses. Otherwise, she said its purpose will eventually be defeated. The president did not, however, respond to bipartisan calls for administration to decide between increasing taxes to add welfare benefits or scaling down on welfare to avoid raising taxes. Earlier on Tuesday, ruling party leader Kim Musang had heavily criticized President Park's election pledge to increase welfare without a tax hike. A recent poll showed 65 percent of Korean people thought it would be impossible to expand welfare without raising taxes. I agree with them, and it would be wrong for a politician to deceive the public by promising more welfare without raising taxes. Instead, Kim said the priority should be to review where the welfare budget is being spent and to seek ways to reduce expenses before opting to raise taxes. As for the government's backtracking on health insurance reforms, Kim vowed to initiate better communication between the party, government and presidential office. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. The president's comments come after the newly elected floor leader of the ruling Senwiri party called for changes to regain the public trust. He says both the president as well as the ruling party are facing a crisis. Our Lee ji has more. For the ruling party's new floor leader, Yu Seung min his win wasn't about an anti-president Park Geun-hye camp defeating a pro bok faction. For him, it signaled a chance for the ruling camp to reform and rebound ahead of next year's general elections. With President Bok's approval ratings at their lowest level since she took office, Yu is calling for policy changes to win back the hearts of a disappointed public. Pointing to criticism of the president's personnel picks, Yu told reporters that President Bok must carry out a drastic shakeup of her people. As for policymaking, he believes the party should take a stance vis-a-vis -vis the presidential office. To do that, he says the party should no longer just support whatever the presidential office lays out in front of them. Instead, the party should play a leading role in setting the agenda for the nation. Yu, however, did promise to improve communications and cooperation with the government to iron out differences before putting major policies into motion. In response to the government's push to increase taxes to cover welfare benefits, he said it's either higher taxes with more benefits or lower taxes with less welfare, not more welfare without a tax hike. Political analysts say the new floor leader's eagerness for change could turn the page for the ruling camp. But it remains to be seen whether the presidential office will lend an ear to his criticisms and demands. Lee Jun, Arirang News. 
Reports are coming out that the U.S. and North Korea have been discussing meeting behind closed doors. This comes as the two sides on the surface at least have been blaming each other for the current deadlock. Our Hwang sung reports. Washington began the new year imposing more sanctions on North Korea. But behind the scenes, the two longtime foes have reportedly been discussing the prospects of restarting dialogue. Citing multiple sources, The Washington Post reported Monday that U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea Policy Sung Kim proposed to meet with North Korean officials in Beijing. This ahead of his trip to Tokyo last week for a trilateral meeting with his South Korean and Japanese counterparts. The report says the North offered to send Ryong Ho to Beijing or suggested the U.S. diplomat visit Pyongyang for a meeting with Kim Ge Gwan and Kang Seok Ju who are both more senior in the foreign ministry than Lee. On a similar note, Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency reported Tuesday that Sung Kim's offer didn't materialize because the North insisted on holding the talks in Pyongyang. This comes as the two sides blame each other for the deadlock in dialogue. Following the trilateral meeting in Tokyo, the U.S. diplomat reiterated the conditions for talks. North Koreans will need to demonstrate uh, its commitment to denuclearization in a concrete manner before we can resume any serious negotiations. North Korea lashed out over the weekend, saying Washington rejected its invitation. But the regime seems far from committed to giving up its nuclear ambitions. Recent satellite imagery shows fresh activity at North Korea's main nuclear plant, a possible indication a reactor there was being restarted. Hwang sung Arirang News. Chinese Defense Minister Chang Wan-chan is in Seoul for a three-day visit to hold talks with his South Korean counterpart Han Ming-gu tomorrow. Topping the agenda will be military and nuclear threats from Pyongyang and the current security situation on the peninsula. They'll also discuss ways to further boost bilateral cooperation, including the establishment of a direct military hotline. Chang is the third Chinese defense minister to visit South Korea, and the last visit of a Chinese defense minister to Seoul was back in 2006. Korea's military court has given a death sentence to a 23-year-old soldier for last year's shooting rampage that took the lives of five soldiers. The court says just because he suffered bullying in school and the army doesn't mean he can get a pardon for killing people. The court added it had no choice but to isolate him from society for good, given that the soldier didn't show any remorse leading up to the ruling. The defendant reportedly plans to appeal. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chedi from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime news, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. Koreans in their 20s and 30s might want to rethink their retirement plans as a recent report shows that 4 in 10 in the cohort will have to work even after they reach the retirement age of 65. Now the problem is the poor quality of their jobs. Our Hwang Jie has the details. When 30-year-old Koreans become 65, the country's employment rate for the elderly is expected to top 40 percent, with more than 7.3 million people their age or older participating in economic activities. Now that points to a need for quality jobs for the elderly who are living in a country that has one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world. A recent report by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs says that the rise in the elderly employment rate comes as life expectancy increases while most of them are unprepared for life after retirement. Korea's life expectancy stood at around 77 years in 2002, but it's expected to rise to 82 and a half years in 2020. The country's elderly poverty rate, however, was close to 50 percent in 2010, the highest among OECD member states. The rate is also around four times higher than the OECD average of 12.4 percent. 
The report adds that more than nine out of ten Korean workers ages 65 or older had either temporary or part time jobs in 2012. With more of the elderly expected to look for jobs in the future, it appears critical for policymakers to find a way to improve the job market for them. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Adding on to worries over the aging population and low birth rates here in Korea, the total number of marriages in 2014 is expected to reach a low not seen in more than a decade. From the January to November period, there were around 271,000 new marriages reported, some 30,000 less than recorded back in 2003, the year that saw the lowest rate since data recording began. Statistics Korea forecasts the number of newborns will reach below 420,000 this year, an unprecedented low since the 60s. Korea's passion for education is world-renowned, but it comes at a hefty price. The average Korean family spends nearly 7% of its income on learning. But current economic conditions may be prompting parents to hold back, especially when it comes to funding overseas schooling. Kim ji has the story. Their chimes at midnight, but high school students in Korea are often still packed with students studying their textbooks. Some shell out big money to follow a separate curriculum offered by private academies in addition to their class materials. It shows just how much Koreans prioritize education, as attending a good university has a tremendous impact on a person's career. However, in recent months, the bad economy has started to have an effect on how much Koreans spend on education. In fact, the Bank of Korea and the Education Ministry say private academy expenses tumbled to a three-year low last year. During the January to November period, money spent on private education academies dropped 0.8 percent from the same period last year to 7.3 billion U.S. dollars. The number of students studying overseas also dropped from 262,000 in 2011 to less than 220,000 last year. Overseas education spending plunged 14 percent last year compared to the previous year amounting to $372 million, a nine-year low. An official from the education ministry says students are heading to English-speaking countries with lower living expenses. The number of Korean students studying in Western countries has waned. In particular, those in Britain have dropped by nearly 60 percent. In stark contrast, Korean students studying in the Philippines jumped 52 percent to more than 7,000 last year. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Tablet PCs were all the rage when they first came out five years ago, but their popularity was not so hot last year. Market research firm IDC says global shipments of tablets declined last quarter for the first time ever to some 76 million units. That's a 3% drop on year. Shipments for the whole of last year did grow, but only by 4.4%, which is far lower than the over 50% increase posted in 2013. IDC cited a wide range of other smart gadgets and a longer replacement cycle for tablets for the slowing growth. The industry watcher, however, forecasts the tablet market will pick up again this year with the introduction of technology innovations. Creating something new usually requires teamwork, well-organized engineering and developmental support. But for one local researcher, determination and thinking outside the box is all it took. He has nearly a hundred inventions under his belt, and our Kim Min Ji had a chance to talk to him about his latest creations. It looks like a scene from Spider-Man. The device made with parts of several vacuum cleaners enables a full-grown man to climb a wall. You might think creating something like this would require many hands with an understanding of scientific theory and technical skills. But it was made by one person on the ground floor of this very average-looking building. The space is a lab of researcher Oh jang who has spent nearly three decades of his life here, working on objects ranging from the functional to the bizarre. If I come across a new technology while reading or surfing the net, I map it out. Then I think about what it could be used for and what types of people would need it. 
O is responsible for nearly 100 inventions that include sophisticated vehicles like hovercrafts and human part aircrafts and the unusual such as this fighter robot. A person can ride it and control the arms and anything can be fired from the pistols. O may be a bit eccentric but he does have a humane side and he is mostly concerned about people in need. I've made customized wheelchairs for the disabled. Everyone has a different disability, so the one I made was to suit the individual. What's more is that O isn't interested in commercializing his creations or making a fortune with them, and this is just something he does because he enjoys it. His latest project is a walking robot, which he says is the first step to making a wearable robot. O hopes that someday the smart gadget will boost the strength of those who find it hard to stand, walk or use their legs. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. U.S. President Barack Obama has submitted a new spending plan for the next fiscal year, following through on his promise to help working-class Americans. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, what are some of the measures outlined in this new government budget? Well, it's a near $4 trillion proposal that is going to help try low and help low- and middle-income households at the cost of higher taxes for big corporations and the wealthiest Americans. The pundits are saying it's a plan that's already dead in the water as it faces tough opposition from Republicans who now control both houses of Congress. Our Song Ji-san gives us the breakdown. Practical, not partisan. That's how U.S. President Barack Obama described his budget proposal of nearly $4 trillion for the fiscal year 2016, which starts in October this year. As earlier outlined in State of the Union speech last month, Obama's plan is aimed at taxing the wealthy to support the middle class. It calls for a one-time 14 percent tax on an estimated $2.1 trillion U.S. dollars of untaxed overseas income, while imposing a 19 percent tax on U.S. companies' future foreign earnings. Obama is also looking to close tax loopholes, such as one on carried interest, to help fund investments in infrastructure and education. It gives Americans of every age the chance to upgrade their skills so they can earn higher wages. And it includes my plan to make two years of community college free for responsible students. The budget calls for $612 billion in overall military spending, which includes funding to defeat Islamic State militants and support NATO and European allies against Russian aggression. The budget foresees a $474 billion deficit at 2.5 percent of the U.S. GDP, which is the lowest level since 2008. It's projected to stabilize at that level reducing the deficit by $1.8 trillion over the next decade. The proposal requires approval from the Congress but faces a rocky road ahead, with House Speaker John Boehner rating Obama's plan as unbalanced, with more spending, more taxes and more debt. Song Jisun, Arirang News. And staying in Washington, officials say they are seriously considering sending weapons over to support Ukraine's fight against the Russia-backed separatists. Fighting has intensified in eastern Ukraine with the latest casualty figures showing at least 16 civilians killed in the last 24 hours. This as the rebel leaders say they are planning on raising their troop numbers. Our Connie Lee reports. The U.S. could be sending lethal aid to Ukraine to help its government fight off attacks by pro-Russian rebels. We haven't taken options on or off the table. It's an ongoing discussion. Obviously, we take into account events on the ground, but I don't have anything to lay out for you in terms of internal deliberations. Well, the... the aid in the form of defensive weapons could include anti-tank, anti-air and anti-mortar systems. Washington already provides a non-lethal military equipment to Ukraine, but U.S. officials say the consideration to send lethal weapons shows Washington's growing frustration with Russia's continued support for rebels and the failed peace talks over the weekend. In a news conference Monday, the rebels blamed Kiev for the collapse of peace talks and said Russia was their true friend.
The hand stretched to us by Russia, by brotherly nation, is turning into a road of life. And today we can clearly see who are our friends and who are not. The rebels have vowed to increase forces to up to 100,000 for their latest offensive strategy in East Ukraine. With this call, the pro-Russian separatists seek to intensify the nine-month-long conflict and push the government forces out of the east of the country. Violence has escalated in recent weeks with both sides mobilizing more forces and more civilians losing their lives. According to the U.N., more than 5,000 people have been killed in the conflict. Connie Lee, Arirang News. The founder and chairman of China's e-commerce giant Alibaba has downplayed a U.S. lawsuit hitting his company, spinning it as a public relations opportunity. Last week, the American law firm Robbins Geller, Rudman and Dowd filed a class action suit against Alibaba for allegedly failing to disclose key information before its IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. Speaking in Hong Kong on Monday, Jack Ma promised he would face the legal action actively and transparently. On one hand, this can let Western societies better understand what Chinese companies can do today and how we operate. So for me, I think we should face this issue and use this opportunity to let the world better understand Alibaba and better understand China, which is a good thing. So on this issue, I believe my legal team can handle it. The information in question includes communications between Alibaba executives and Chinese regulators over concerns of fake products being sold on its websites. And finally, the biggest stars in Hollywood have gathered to drum up some Oscar buzz ahead of the iconic awards ceremony later this month. More than 150 high-profile actors, directors and producers took part Monday in the annual luncheon at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Rubbing elbows at the event were A-list celebrities including Julianne Moore, Reese Witherspoon, Michael Keaton, Steve Carell and many more. The 87th Academy Awards will be hosted by the famed actor and Broadway star Neil Patrick Harris. It'll be his first time taking the helm at the Oscars. And you can catch a televised ceremony live on Sunday, February 22nd. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Che with the Sports Brief. Now the Premier League's January transfer window came to a close with some big deals made. For Koreans though, the most exciting was Lee chung yongs move from Bolton to Crystal Palace. The 26-year-old signed a contract running through 2018 for an undisclosed sum and joins a Crystal Palace side that's had a busy January swapping footballers as they look to avoid relegation this season. He also returns to top flight football after over two seasons in the second division known as the championship. The midfielder leaves Bolton, his first club overseas, after a memorable five and a half years in which he appeared 195 times and scored 20 goals. In other football news, Uzbekistan has apologized for the on-pitch violence by two of its under-22 players in the 1-0 loss against South Korea at the Kings Cup on Sunday. In a statement, the nation's football federation also said that it will discipline the two players with sanctions and that it already sent one of them home. The flying kick and slap punch attacks put a damper on the, pr the proposed friendly match between the two nations' senior teams scheduled for late next month. And heading to Tuesday's live games, first to Ursan as the Mobis Phoebus took on the Koyang Orions. And the Phoebus shot to a 25-7 lead in the first quarter, eventually taking a 20-point lead into the final period. The Orions couldn't make the comeback as Mobis took home their second straight win. And over to pro volleyball, the men were in action as the LIG Graders faced the Samsung Hwaje Blue Fangs. With both coming off losses over the weekend, the last place Graders pushed the top ranked Blue Fangs to the deciding fifth set. But there, the Blue Fangs attack was too potent, giving them the edge and the close victory. 
And that's all I have for now. Stay tuned for the weather up next. Have a good night. Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Gyeok with your weather outlook. It was an early spring like day with clear skies nationwide due to a high pressure front from China, but air quality remains very dry in parts of Jeolla Namdo and Gyeongsang Namdo province where humidity levels have dipped to as low as 38% and this will continue until tomorrow's showers. Taking a closer look, less than 5 millimeters of precipitation is forecast for the coast of both Gyeongsang Namdo provinces as well as Jeju. Well, tomorrow is Ipchun here in Korea, which is a seasonal indicator that marks the beginning of spring and mild winter conditions are in store. But the fine dust index may rise above normal levels down south, so those with respiratory problems should be aware. Looking ahead on Thursday, there is a possibility of showers on the eastern coast as well as Jeju. Also, cold air will gradually move in, pushing down Friday's morning lows to 6 degrees, minus 6 that is. On to Wednesday's readings, Seoul starts off the day at minus 3 with a high of 5, Gwangju hits 6, Daegu and Busan hits 8. Meanwhile, Jeju reaches a high of 6, Daejeon and Tokyo hit 4, Mount Kumgang dips to minus 5. That'll do it for now, but more updates coming up after midnight. See you soon. And that's primetime news for this Tuesday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. And I'm Gang Chedi. Have a great night. We'll see you again soon.